Okay, thank you. Welcome back. I hope you had a nice chance to network there and stretch the legs. Um, the second keynote speaker for today is also a new colleague to Ansvar, Adrian Dendolk. Um, Adrian brings over 21 years of experience in the insurance broking industry to Ansvar Risk. Um, he's currently a part-time lecturer at the Australian Institute of Company Directors, focusing on strategy and risk, and you'll see that today. Um, Adrian has lots of interests. He's a keen tennis player, a keen sailor, but he tells me that um, as he's a rugby uh, union um, former player and, and loves the game, he's going to get in amongst you today as a front rower. So expect him to be moving about. So if he comes your way, don't be scared. He's only there to help you. So I'll pass you on to Adrian. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> Matt uh, mistakenly introduced Anthony in the wrong way. He didn't start by acknowledging that Anthony was a seven times AFL final goal umpire. That's the important thing to introduce. Where is Anthony now? He's hiding, he's hiding. That's the important thing to, uh, and, 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 and of course the, the cultural significance of that and the issues that Anthony raised of culture. My first culture shock was when I arrived at Melbourne Airport. And, uh, and the second question after handing in my passport was, which team do you support? <laughs> so uh, then I knew I was in, in, in trouble. Because my colleagues in Johannesburg asked me, what did I do wrong when I got sent to Melbourne? There's no rugby union. That was in May 97. We had the Bledis Low Cup match. 100,000 people at the MCG. What more can you ask for? I sent them more rude messages. So that was, uh, that was all sold. But yes, I'd like to do, I do like to scrum in. And uh, I'm a bowman at sailing. So I like to get, get into, uh, into things. The second culture shock that I was uh, exposed to was the term mongrel. Now, it made no sense to me. Slattery and Phil Doran took me to see a client, Mal Brow. Do you remember the football player? And, and they showed me photographs. I think it was a, called a coat hanger. I think there were about five players lying on the ground. And they said he was a mongrel. Now, I didn't quite understand that because coming with my code, there was Willie John McBride, J.P.R. Williams. There was Colin Tree Trunk Mead. There was Frick Dupree from my country. That's what you do. That's supposed to do that. But what I, when I truly understood it was I had the corner office. Not the corner office, as in Warren has. You know, the, <laughs> I, had the, I had the Harry Potter corner office, you know, the, <laughs> next to the cleaning materials. You, you get the idea? And nobody came to, to speak to me or talk to me until the visiting South African cricket team lost six wickets for 30 runs. <laughs> Every mongrel in the office came to ask if I knew what the score was. Then I got it. Then I got it. And that is then the issue of culture. And uh, I worked with Rakesh at that time, introduced uh, into the whole, whole environment. But the third culture shock was the term, and it's my hair at the back of my neck still rise. She'll be right, mate. No. <laughs> I, I still tremble when I hear those terms. Isn't that correct, Rakesh? I mean, that is just the most awful words you can hear if you are involved in risk management. And that is what Anthony was introducing us to. So I'm going to give a, a journey on governance, on why are we here in this position of governance. And I'm going to touch on four revolutions. The discovery of the new world, the French Revolution, you know, quite interesting enough, I had an English army officer work with me, and I asked him, well, how was it with this Cold War issue with Russia and so on? He said, ah, oh, that was this recent stuff. The eternal enemy is France. That's where the real battle is. <laughs> and we see that with Brexit now, I think. With our <laughs> so uh, we're going to talk about the French Revolution. We're going to touch on the industrial and energy revolutions. And then we're going to conclude or expand on the information revolution and what that means to us. So let's look at the discovery of the new world. Professor Sachs des describes this as one of the most important events that has taken place, the finding of the new world. And why, why would the Portuguese governments, Spaniards, the English, why would they spend a lot of money in sending ships to find a route to the east. Why do you think that? Do you want to hazard a guess? Try? Other one? Spices. Spices. 
So they had come out of the Dark Ages. The, country, the, middle, uh, the uh, Europe and England was getting wealthier. And with wealth comes greater use, uh, 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 diet of protein. So to try and preserve meat, you have no refrigerator. You have salt and pepper, and pepper to deal with the taste, the, the, the rotting meat. And you want to at least flavor the meat in some way. All it was, it rancid is the other word, a nice word, but it's rotten. And to flavor that. So spice in its, by weight was more valuable than gold. But of course you want, while you're going around, you can, Sir Walter Raleigh was a pirate, for example. And what that meant was, instead of relying on the silk route from the east, you wanted to have direct access. Does that make sense? So the world started opening up, and there was trade taking place. The second revolution, being the French Revolution, was for the first time when the concept of the of human right of the individual was introduced. Egalité, liberté, fraternité. So the declaration of, of, you, of the rights of the human, of the person, was declared for the first time. Until then, kings were anointed and seen to have been anointed by God. So the authority came from a religious point of view. And we still see that in many of the Middle Eastern countries, where families, the Saud family, for example, is still, are still the rulers of Saudi Arabia, by way of example. But in the Western world, for the first time, we saw the concept of the right of the individual. But also, and this was uh, just after the Treaty of Westphalia, the 30-year war between the Catholics and the Irish princes across Europe, of the declaration of nation states and citizens. A major, major change, a major revolution. The third was the creation of a company. So these companies were charter companies, the Dutch East India Company, the East India Company, the British South African Company with uh, 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 Rhodes, Cecil John Rhodes. So these were, for the first time, uh, Prior to that, the only people who amassed wealth were the, were, were the aristocrats. So, they, uh, so any uh, uh, funds generated, extra funds generated, went into the treasury of the barons and the kings and, and the various aristocrats. And for the first time with charter companies, you could form together and create income. And of course, that was the creation of our insurance market, Lloyd's at the same time, sending ships and, 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 and taking that risk on board. However, there was no distinction between government and business. So the Viceroy of India was also a director of the East India Company. And Clive, Viceroy of India, stole so much from the Indian population that the Hindu term loot was introduced into the English language for the first time. So this pillaging was seen as the correct thing to do. Cecil John Rhodes invaded the Transvaal to go after gold while he was the premier of the Cape province and a, a owner of De Beers Mining, Goldfields Mining, and others. So there was no distinction between these. The East India Company under Lord Auckland, Viceroy of India, invaded China with the use of opium. You may recall the opium wars. Used opium as a way of, 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 of overcoming resistance. And they saw no, nothing wrong with that. They saw this is the way you, you do business. And with all the misery that went with it, and the start of the hundred years of shame that the Chinese population experienced uh, leading until the recent, and I'll come back to the recent times. The third generation revolution is that of the industrial and energy revolutions. So from agrarian societies, where everything was tilled, land was tilled by hand, you had the, the introduction of steam engines, rail, etc. And you can just imagine the e economic growth that took place as a result of that. And on top of that, you had the move from steam. So from sail, you went to steam, if you think of shipping, and then from steam to oil. So when Churchill, as first sea lord, introduced oil into the Royal Navy in 1914, they increased the speed of Royal Navy boats and ships 
by five to six knots. Now, in today's t terminology, that doesn't sound much, but that gave them a massive strategic advantage over the German Navy and other navies because they controlled the global sea routes and the, sea, the seas the, of, of the world. A massive improvement on trade and the speed of trade and the ability to distribute goods and services worldwide. However, with that, of course, came the reliance on oil and the activities in the Middle East, and I'll touch on that a little later. The fourth revolution, that of information, and I've used the share price of Apple to illustrate the speed at which this has taken place. Can anyone recall the introduction, introduction of iPod? You remember? Anyone else? Can you remember when it happened? Not long ago. My wife gave me one of these things for Christmas. I thought, what rubbish. And I opened this thing. What a rubbish thing. I already hear voices. And I must walk around with this thing in my ear. What, 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 what do I do with this thing? But it has taken over. And it's now morphed into uh, the phone. Not every one of us, as we walk out of here, the first thing we do is have a look at the phone. Nespa, isn't that so? So how it, has, how it has overtaken every aspect of our lives and speeded up information, and now we can do financial transactions by phone. So M-Pesa in Africa has a greater reach in the movement of cash and money than any of the ATM or other banking sectors the world has ever experienced. All contributing to greater economic development and growth. So all four of these revolutions. If we look at the, the growth and the reach of the IT and the information industry, Facebook has 1.44 billion users, more than the population of China. My adult daughter can't have a meal with us unless she's grimacing. She grins inanely and then takes a photograph of herself. <laughs> And he posts it on the telegram or some, or she has snap a chatter and all these things. I, w I, I want to talk to you. Why are you doing this all the time? Isn't that what they do? Most annoying. Most annoying. But that's why these businesses have taken off. That's why they have taken off and they're all working. And that has led to the, to the situation that we are living in the richest period of history than what we have ever experienced. We are richer. We live longer, as Anthony has mentioned. Sorry, just in the top right hand, do I have a pointer? In my previous days, I used to have a stick that used to do this, but these days it's just... There's more of us, but also we have had the safest period of time in terms of wars. We, we, for 70 years, we've had the longest period of peace the world has ever experienced. And part of that is because of mutually assured destruction. There are so many nuclear weapons facing each other that if anyone starts a nuclear war, we are mutually assured of our, all of our destruction. So that holds that... That, that tension holds us in abeyance of serious war. We have declining homicide rates worldwide. And to Anthony's point in terms of risk perception against re the reality, do you remember that slide, that very busy slide from the World Economic Forum? Those were issues of, of, of concern, of skirmishes in the military scenes. Those are skirmishes that you see in Syria and in other areas. Of course, it's sad for the people living there, but in world terms, in world war terms, those are not major, major uh, conflagrations. Now, as we, uh, English is my third language, so please excuse me for mangling the, the, the language. But for every silver cloud, there's a dark lining. <laughs> so there's a, a problem with this, because we're having such a good, good life, and things are happening, and we're extending our lifetime. All the things that our previous generations would have wished for we have, but are we happier? We have seen, in, as a result of the economic miracle of China, 
100 million people uplifted out of poverty. An absolute miracle. 800 million people. We've met all of the United Nations development goals with that. But let's see where that, what also contributed to that, and that was the limited, the introduction of the limited liability company. So charter companies had unlimited liability. So just like a Lloyd's name, if you were a shareholder in a charter company, your liabilities were unlimited. In the middle of the 19th century, limited liability companies were, were created, which meant that your limit of your exposure to the company was the same value as the shares that you had purchased. So if you purchased $100 worth of shares, your liability is limited to $100, in essence. And that was the boost that created this economic miracle that we have experienced. But, as I said, that silver cloud has a dark lining. And that was because of the concept of agency that has been introduced into our corporate governance model. And that is that there's a layer, a, 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 a distance, an increasing distance between the owners, the shareholders, and the managers. Because so many of us are shareholders. Who, does, who do the managers listen to? From whom do they take their instructions? Sorry? From the directors. So for the directors to ensure that there's alignment between the shareholders' value and what the managers do, the concept of agency was introduced. And that is linking remuneration of senior executives with share price. The implication of that has been, and especially for listed companies, that salaries and remuneration of senior executives since the 1990s, together with the regulatory openness, the unbundling of stock exchanges and markets and banks, has meant that remuneration has climbed through the roof. Without a, a the same amount of risk taking by those same managers. So they can take on more adverse risk to chase that increased return for themselves. But let's look at what this has meant. Just taking the top five companies of the US S&P 500, top 500 companies in the United States, Rex Tillerson, in his final year as CEO of Exxon, was paid $289 million in one year. And note, I use the word pay. He didn't, I didn't use the word earned. He was paid. Now, how, how do they do that? They do that by maintaining the share price through, th through share buybacks, so buying excess capital on the market, using cash in the company to buy back shares, which means there's less shares in circulation, which means the price goes up, by paying a lot of dividends, which means there's a limited amount left for the people and for new thoughts in the company, new investments the reinvestment component has reduced. And how does that impact us all? Well, you must have heard of Occupy Wall Street, the 1%. Well, according to the United Nations, it's not the 1%. It's the 0.0001%. The top 300 wealthiest people in the world now have more money than the bottom half, than 3 billion people. Jeff Bezos, I think two weeks ago, went through the... $150 billion mark, his personal value. I think, Sharon, you'd love him as a net worth, high net worth client. I mean, that would be right up your... Oh, yes, oh, yes, now you take it. Yes, 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 exactly, exactly. One person, $150 billion. And the irony of that, there are no tangible assets. 
not as if it's built as if he built an empire. It is, it is intangible. Any accountants in the room, if I could get a view? In, so we see in, on asset and balance sheets, intangibles. What does that mean? In reality, what is an intangible asset? Brand value. Because the difference between the intangible and the, and the, and the asset, the actual assets that they have, because well, if the company goes bankrupt, what can they sell at auction? Ferry Hodgson, Hodgson are having a knees up on the 17th floor. You know, those other, I mean, I'm not going to say mongrels, other, uh, uh, you know, uh, bankruptcy people, you know, who do deal with bankruptcy. You can't, you've got nothing to sell. So therefore, reputation management becomes an issue, just as an aside. But current, in the, in the 1950s, the biggest employer in the U.S. was General Motors, with a 2016 average wage of $30 an hour. Currently, Walmart is the biggest employer, with 2016 wages of $6.50 an hour. So we have seen globally the reduction in wages, and I'll come back to that in a moment. At the same time, we've seen the removal of middle management out of organizations. The cutting out of middle layers, and it's called a productivity dividend. So getting more done with less people, relying more on robotics and, and IT and these things. Sound familiar? You can't get an approval from a bank manager by going to see your bank manager. You might, speak, you might be lucky to find an, a human person there, but that human has to phone somebody somewhere else in a central office where they make the decision. So you've reduced the human engagement piece. I'm sure you're all familiar with the Macondo oil well disaster, BP suffered 10 years ago, 28, in the Gulf of Mexico. At the time of the incident, and the greatest, the largest environmental spillage the world has ever experienced, at the time, the New York, New York Times estimated the loss between 17 and 30 billion dollars. BP had 300 million worth of liability cover. Completely wrong decision in their decision making. Why? Because one is that they took a view that this won't happen, exactly what Anthony was talking about is not having an understanding of what their real exposure is and having removed all their controls. The assurance report by one of the big four accounting firms said they had taken a view on this, on, 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 on BP's uh, risk management by telephone interviews, selected telephone interviews with people nominated by BP and they had not visited any of the sites, had not gone to an, an oil rig. And yet they provided an assurance statement in the annual report to BP. Now, till date, until, until now, the losses have been $75 billion. Far in excess of what was estimated at the time. And we all know about long tail claims, environmental claims. How long does that take to work through? That isn't the beginning, even, of their losses and that's coming back to the reputation issue, is because if they are deemed to be unconscionable as managers, because before this incident, they had the Texas City refinery explosion, also people dead, also environmental damage. They had fa failures of pipelines in Alaska, all to do with cost cutting. The root cause is all cost cutting, removing costs from the business. But if they then get banished by the US government to tender for US government oil supply, they lose their single biggest client in the world. So that is the impact that comes back to us as risk managers and risk financiers. So we have seen, and Anthony referred to some in the aged care, but if we look at dream world, I'm sure you've all seen you saw that in the news with the dream world collapse? On Tuesday, I was reading the Daily Truth, I mean, uh, sorry, the Fun Review. <laughs> and the headline was, Arden cuts 75 million from the value of dream world. So let's just look at what they're saying. And as a result of higher insurance costs associated with the fatal 2016 accident that killed four people, 
The 75 million in, cut in value from the Dreamworld property followed an $89 million devaluation last year and was accompanied by a further 11 million in costs related to the accident, goodwill losses, and asset impairment write-downs for the division. So the question is, do you think they will ever recover? Do you think they will ever recover the asset value in terms of what their share price was? And it's for silly things. And it's the kind of challenges that Anthony was referring to in his vignette in the aged care facility of what all these things that are going on at the same time. Now let's look at what, it, what the human cost is. So that's the corporate cost. What is the human cost? The human cost, as I mentioned, was first of all, average hourly compensation, wages, has flatlined since 1973 whereas productivity has increased. But for all of us, we have seen a reduction of our income, while the top 0.1, 0.01 have amassed massive amounts to, to an extent not even experienced before the French Revolution, which resulted, which was the trigger for the people revolting. I don't need, I could spend an hour just on populism but we've seen politically a world around the world a retreat into populism and people withdrawing from the global trade and the, and the advantage that we've had of this global trade and this open environment. So what further is the human cost? What we are seeing, especially in Australia, winners and losers. The winners are those who are technically literate and technologically literate, who understand the use of technology. But not everyone is. Not everyone is. Where are, where are the trades these days and TAFEs? Why aren't people learning actual practical trades? Why isn't that attractive? And well, that means that we are seeing, especially young, without skills, with substance and other abuse problems, and especially in the country areas. And the impact of this is that we have seen in the United States, firstly, the greatest amount of fatalities as a result of opiate abuse. It starts with painkillers. I'll just get the quote. So it starts with painkillers. And then moves, in, and Anthony will be able to or understand this, fentanyl. Apparently it's used to, to sedate horses. Gets, now gets used, and people uh, use fentanyl and other forms of opiates to maintain an edge. And we are seeing an increased use of amphetamines and pseudo, uh, and, and various forms of amphetamines. And the, and the part of that is because of the wage drop $6.50 an hour, people are keeping two to three jobs to keep going, which means that they need some form of, of, of stimulant to keep them awake. A truck driver was caught driving down from northern Canada, from the northern Canada-Alaska border, and he was caught in Florida, having driven a truck nonstop. Nonstop. So that is from roughly Darwin to, to Margaret River non-stop, because he was under pressure for a delivery. That's just an example. In the whole of Southeast Asia, we are seeing the scourge. Heroin and opium and these drugs are not the popular drugs. It's these artificial drugs, which are easy to manufacture, which is becoming the drug scourge. And those are the same people operating our machines and who work with us and who, who we engage with on a day-to-day -day basis. And with that, we are seeing the greater awareness or the great, this has been there, but what we are seeing is that depression and mental health challenges is becoming one of the key issues that we are facing. And from our own industry journal, ANSIF, we, can, we see, and this is 2016, so some time ago, one in five Australian adults have experienced some form of mental disorder. Anxiety, 
depressive episodes, and the costs are growing. So this is the impact of governance. What we do argue with these challenges in place, that we can support you and your clients in decision making and introducing correct and appropriate governance measures that will help your organization and your clients perform better, improve their manner and ways of dealing with things, but most importantly, to act in an ethical and correct way. And that is applied to our value base and to the kind of clients that we like to engage with. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.